G'day everyone. Welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video, we're going to talk about how PAO synthetics are manufactured. So if you'll remember um, when we talked about mineral oils, so I want to contrast synthetics with mineral oils. Uh, mineral oils all start their lives as crude oils and they're kind of a mix of all kinds of different molecules. And the refining process is about um, refining and organizing those molecules into like-for-like -like molecules that give you the bulk properties that you desire out of your lubricant. So each of these steps kind of imparts different properties by doing things like removing waxes, uh, breaking aromatic rings, uh, saturating you know, double bonds and things like that. Ultimately what it's doing if we take this sort of three-axis model where we have aromatics, naphthenes, and paraffins, as we move from group one to group two to group three, we are eliminating all the aromatics and naphthenes, and we're ending up with a more paraffinic base oil product. So as we move from group one to group three, it becomes more paraffinic. All right, so now let's talk about how we manufacture a PAO synthetic, and a, and a polyalpha olefin th synthetic starts its life with ethylene gas. Now, ethylene is like the basic building block of a whole range of different uh, methods in industrial chemistry. In some ways, you can think of it as the standard 4x2 Lego brick. So it is the brick on which all of the other bricks are based. So, as an example, with ethylene gas, if you polymerize it, Right, so adding ethylenes together, you get polyethylene, which is, of course, used in all kinds of plastics and um, different industries. If you have ethylene oxide, that's kind of antifreeze as well as a whole bunch of other chemicals. Ethylene dichloride gives you vinyl. Styrene gives you rubber. And, of course, the one that we're interested in is when you polymerize polyethylene and you get to a PAO. So how does that happen? Well, let's first of all um, kind of tease out the meaning of polyalpha olefin. So if we start with uh, a molecule like decane, so that's, a, that's 10 carbons and it's all saturated. Okay, so that's decane. Decene is that same molecule, but it has a single double bond. And when something has a double bond like this, it's referred to as an olefin. Now, this happens to be 3 decene because the double bond is on the third carbon in the chain. If that double bond moves to the first carbon in the chain, it's known as 1 decene, and this kind of molecule is known as an alpha olefin, right? Because the, the double bond is in the first position, so it's an alpha olefin. And if we were to take a whole bunch of these and connect them together, then we have a poly-alpha olefin. So that's where the name comes from. And that's really the process that we're going to use to build our PAO molecule. In this case, I'm calling this a 1-decene pentamer. Um, that's just because there's five of them. Um, you know, a tetramer would be if we had uh, f four of these molecules um, put together into a PAO. All right, so let's um, look at that on... The, the graph that we had for the, uh, the mineral base stocks, as you can see on the left, it is the, the thing about polyalpha alpha olefins is that they are a pure paraffinic. They have no naphthenes and no aromatics because we started with ethylene gas, which of course has no aromatic or naphthenic content. So a PAO represents kind of the pinnacle in what the refining process is aiming for. It is a pure paraffin. All right, so going back to our decene molecule, let's look at how the actual manufacturing process goes. So um, most PAOs start with decene as being their kind of feedstock, right? So this is, this is the raw material that you build your molecules from. It's not always decene, it um, can be octene, you know, that has eight carbons, or sometimes dodecene, which has 12. 
there's a bit of variability there and, and some of that goes down to um, just the raw material market as well, what's available. But there is a bit of flexibility in the system. But anyway, you take this uh, one decine molecule and obviously you need lots of them. And what you do is that you react it with a catalyst. Now, the most basic catalysts for producing low viscosity polyalpha olefins is something called boron trifluoride. So it's BF3. Um, that's a, it's a gas, right? And I guess the uh, equivalent or uh, analogous uh, molecule would be something like ammonia, which is NH3, right? It's a very similar chemical structure, um, but it's boron trifluoride. Um, it also requires what they call a, a, a protic uh, catalyst as well. So you can use either uh, water or sometimes we use um, uh, alcohols or a carboxylic acid. Um, in any event, there will be a, a protic catalyst that goes on with it as well. When we do that, um, reacting with that catalyst produces a, a reaction which is called oligomerization. So it's, it's creating oligomers of desine. And so in this case, you know, we've been able to connect um, and react five desine molecules together to create one polyalpha olefin molecule. Now, that, that process is not necessarily going to be perfect. So sometimes we do get branched structures. Um, and so uh, that can alter the properties of the, the finished product as well. The final thing to note is that when we connected all of those together through the, a catalytic process, there is the end molecule is always going to have a, a double bond remaining because it's not connecting to another carbon on the other side. So we also have to go through a process of hydrogenation where we react the polyalpha olefin with um, hydrogen gas under pressure to break that final double bond. And the reason we want to do that is for oxidative stability reasons because double bonds are weaker than, uh, than single bonds. All right, so now let's look at all of those steps in the reaction and kind of determine um, what, we, what do we have control over. Okay, so one of the things that we have control over is the olefin chain length. So I've used the example of where we're using desine as a, as a starting feedstock. Doesn't necessarily need to be the case. If we had started with uh, octane, for example, you would get um, shorter branches off the um, poly-alpha olefin uh, backbone. The other thing that we have control over is the temperature and the time of the catalytic reaction. Um, so if we were to uh, take the reaction a bit longer, as an example, um, it would just start to continue building that chain. And that's how you add molecular weight, and that's how you add viscosity. So if you want a more viscous uh, base oil product in the end, you would let the reaction continue on. Um, the other things that you can change are catalyst pressure, catalyst concentration, and the type of catalyst as well. So I use the example here of a, of a boron trifluoride, but if you want higher molecular weights than about uh, 20 centistoke, um, and I should note that in the base oil market, so Finnish lubes tend to um, uh, refer to their molecular weight um, or the viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius, whereas the base oil market does it at 100 degrees Celsius. It's just kind of a quirk of the system. But if you go um, for high molecular weight um, uh, base oils, then you're going to need a different catalyst. And there is actually a uh, another technology out there, which is a metallocene catalyst, which produces metallocene PAOs, which have non-branched structures. Um, and they, they have that's beneficial for things like the viscosity index. Um, the co-catalyst concentration and co-catalyst feed rate. So I mentioned uh, the fact that that co-catalyst is either going to be uh, water, an alcohol, or maybe a carboxylic acid. Um, so we can we can alter those to alter the properties as well. The olefin feed rate is going to have a um, an effect on the final product. The reaction quench. So after you've um, run that catalytic reaction, it's often quenched with water to stop the reaction. Uh, the hydrogenation also occurs under a catalyst as well, so getting control of that um, and the type of catalyst that's used. 
And then finally distillation. So after the, the reaction quenching with water, you need to get rid of all that water that might be in the system, as well as um, some of the catalysts. So you might have some BF3, some, some of that boron trifluoride in the, in the product. You obviously want to distill that out so that you're left with a, a pure PAO at the end. Also, how does that react? So how do those reactions um, kind of manifest and, and what are the physical properties that manifest in the final product? Well, the good thing with this, this reaction process and this manufacturing process is that we can get a lot of different viscosity grades. So simply by allowing the reaction to go longer, we can obtain larger PAO molecules and therefore um, you know, higher viscosities. It also has fantastic low temperature performance, and that's because, as you can see through this process, there are no wax molecules. So it means that at very low temperatures, you know, your dropping points are going to be very, very low. There's also a lot, very low volatility. So the distribution of molecules, and I think I did this in the mineral versus PAO video, it's a very tight distribution of molecular sizes. So you don't get those light ends, which tend to sort of flash off. Um, it has excellent stability. So one of the other things that you'll notice about this diagram is it's all single bonds, right? There's no double bonds in there, which are... Uh, more susceptible to oxidation than, than others. You get a high viscosity index. So um, high VI, first of all, paraffinics um, are the molecules uh, that have better VI, right, rather than the naptenics um, and the aromatics. So immediately, PAO being a, a pure paraffinic is going to have a very high VI. And VI also goes down to the size of the molecule as well, which, of course, we can build... Uh, very big PAO molecules. Uh, low traction coefficient, because all the molecules are roughly the same size and shape, particularly with metallocene PAOs with no branch structures. You get a lot of hydrolytic stability as well. So one thing that you'll notice about this molecule, it's very non-polar. So I've described before that the carbon-hydrogen bond is very non-polar. This molecule as a whole is mostly carbon-hydrogen bonds, and it's a very regular shape. As a result, water being polar, it doesn't tend to, um, well, they're, they're not really miscible with each other. So uh, this is not hygroscopic at all. Uh, so PAOs won't pull moisture out of the air um, and they tend to shed water very, very well. It also has good corrosion protection and that's partially down to the fact that it doesn't take on water. So, so water obviously uh, raises the, the corrosive potential um, by allowing uh, dissociation of, of acidic compounds, and so we don't we don't get that with PAOs. It's also non-toxic because of a lack of aromatic rings, um, but unfortunately the downsides are we can sometimes have low compatibility with some uh, seal um, products, and it also has low solubility with polar additives. So these are the metal reactive ones like uh, metal deactivators. Uh, anti-wear additives, EP additives, anything that really needs to adhere to a metal surface has very low solubility in a PAO. And that's often why uh, with a PAO, it will need an ester or an alkylated naphthalene cobase in order to um, solvate uh, uh, those, um, those additives. So anyway, I hope that's been a helpful introduction to how you would build a polyalpha olefin and how the manufacturing process uh, results in some of its physical properties. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.